um, and Brenda is here and Rachel is here as well. And um, Brenda and Rachel, I know that you were at the tail end of the conversation yesterday. If you have extra words that you wanna share after Mia, I would be happy to hear them um, this afternoon. Um, but we are back live on YouTube and um, I'd just like to welcome back Mia Schultz from the Rutland area NAACP. Um, Mia was here yesterday and testified on H320 and also wanted to be able to weigh in on H329, which is what we heard from um, a number of witnesses yesterday and we ran out of time. So I wanted to make sure that rather than to shoehorn um, Mia in that we were able to have her come back today. So welcome. Um, and the microphone is yours, Mia. If you could just reintroduce yourself and, and let us know uh, your thoughts on H329, we would appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you again for this opportunity. My name is, again, for the record, Mia Schultz, and I am the president of the Rutland Area NAACP. Uh, the NAACP is in 100, a 113 year old national civil rights organization. And it is the longest uh, running, most powerful civil rights organization in the nation for people of color. Uh, we work to, to disrupt inequality and dismantle racism and accelerate change. So thank you again for having me here to speak on H329. I'll start by saying I just so appreciated uh, Boar Yang's testimony yesterday. Uh, she, in my eyes, really successfully outlined the legal and, um, and policy pieces with, um, you know, examples that beautifully uh, gave uh, real life court examples. Um, so in my capacity here, many times I bring um, to these spaces a conversation about humanity to, to legislation. Um, and I see this bill again, like, like I did as I did in 320 as a step towards releasing burdens uh, that are placed on victims. Um, I'll go on record to say also that, that um, and I'm okay with saying this, that the system intentionally makes these burdens um, and has, has so for hundreds of years. This has been demonstrated time and time again with many of the injustices that we confront as people of color. Um, so in terms of this particular uh, legislation, I'll attempt to address some of the key components that are part of it. I, again, Boar did a really excellent job outlining all of that and you guys have um, the definitions and such, but I'll just touch on some of the things that were key to me. Um, broadening the definitions uh, to, provo to, to prove uh, severe and pervasive, uh, to be per severe and perva pervasive, excuse me, um, protects the per perpetrators and, and not the victims. And many times the people who make the determinations don't on whether or not something is severe and pervasive don't actually have the particular experience with that particular di discrimination, uh, especially in a place like Vermont, where most of the people, including judges who determine the summary judgments are able-bodied cisgender white men. So if you ask yourself, how would they know how severe and pervasive it could be, what lens are they, are they using for those standards? It could be completely subjective and it has been. Um, so um, just, you know, it's, I just wanna also put out there that victims of discrimination cases um, to come forth with it, um, it takes an incredibly incredible amount of bravery and courage to do that. Um, and so to basically go through this process of proving your humanity and work to folks who have never, ever experienced this and probably will never experience this based on their positionality, um, that there's doubt takes, takes a lot out of you. And so coming forth 
uh, to prove basically this language is severe and pervasive um, as a victim is quite, um, like I said, humiliating. I also think about um, when I speak to, to victims of discrimination cases, people who come to me um, with their stories of racial discriminations in particular, and I, and I give them like the reality that it's a hard, long road to take. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, generally people though, who come forward in a general sense with these cases, they're not trying to scam the system. They're, they're just trying to get justice. They're trying to get closure. And we really need to believe these people who experience this, who are telling their truths. But we can also believe the people, the experts like myself and many, many other people who have, who have indeed experienced some of the things that they're, they're going through and, and people and, and organizations like the HRC who are experts in investigating these types of things instead of leaving that up to people who don't, who have never experienced that kind of harassment. And they can confirm that this is indeed a discrimination that disrupts your life, right? So um, to speak on the time frame for the statute of limitations, I just wanted to, and some of the other people who spoke before talked about, you know, the need, there's time that it takes to do things to get yourself safe in some of these particular cases, right? To be able to uh, buy new housing and things like that. But there's also this human element, right? To come forward and have that courage that I spoke of, um, that I spoke of earlier, to come forward and tell your story. And we're all different because we're all humans. And some of us are ready to tell it right away. But some of us need to take this time to really process what happened to them, to process the whole thing. And, and having this definitive answer that you have six years or whatever amount of time, I think that you all know that they had six years to do that, is what's needed to just come forth. This has been time and time addressed in, the, in, in cases of um, um, rape, for example right, that there is trauma that is associated with this. And sometimes that trauma takes time to be able to um, go through this process that uh, I have already explained is quite arduous. And then uh, the other part of the legislation that I wanted to um, kind of speak to is the, the piece that you have to find this comparable case. And I think Carrie and the last one of her testimony, she said, this is, she used the word, this is an ins insurmountable hurdle. I agree completely. Uh, there have been times myself that I have not been able to advocate for people because we don't, we simply don't have the resources to be able to tap into the healthcare facilities or the uh, police departments or the, or, or, the employment um, offices to find these comparable cases, um, right? And even if we did find a comparable case or one that appeared to be comparable, really there is no experience again like that of a person who has been marginalized that can be compared to a white, white cisgender, able-bodied, person. So you're talking about things that don't even exist, but making that a, requir a requirement in order to file. So, so I just wanted to, you know, reiterate what my other, the other people in the room have already given you is that this, this, this need, this burden to prove that there's a comp comparable case is almost impossible. And it's really kind of gaslighting, if you really ask me. Like, it says it didn't happen unless it's already happened to somebody who doesn't look like you, right? That means 
your experience is now invalidated because it didn't happen to the dominant culture. And so it's kind of feeding into this narrative that, um, that what we say isn't true. Um, and then I just wanted to finalize my statement here today by going back to that piece where I said the system intentionally creates these barriers. And I just wanna be very uh, clear that I, the system is big, it's broad, it's hundreds of years. It's not any directed to anybody in particular in this room. And that um, it's not personal to anybody in this room, but your position and privilege and structural power right here, here you have this opportunity really to, to do that, what I talked about the end of the season is dismantle the burdens that are placed on the most vulnerable people in our communities. So I'm urging you to see our humanity and, and I appreciate your service. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mia. Um, any questions for Mia this afternoon? Um, Mia, there's a in, in this legislation, there's a real differential or it's an addition to some of our discrimination laws of adding Harris or just, you know, the words Harris or discriminate. Um, can you speak to that a little bit from, from an, your experiences when trying to help with people deal with the discrimination laws that we already have? Is this something you're comfortable talking about? So, I mean, I don't know if I really understand the question. Uh, maybe if you could clarify a little bit more, like the difference between harassment- Add, and Adding the word harass. Harass, right. Yeah, to, to, to the discrimination, um, to some of our dis discrimination laws, you know, it broadens it just a little bit, but in terms of, I, I'm just playing with the, not playing with it, but just trying to like understand the expansion of, of, of what's real experience for people because determining what discrimination is, it, it is difficult um, under any circumstances. Is, this, is determining what harassment is um, in these cases as difficult? You know, I mean, that would take the, some of the legal people, but in my eyes, I don't know. And, and I haven't done a whole lot of, you know, investigating on the different ways and terminology it shows up, but harassment seems to be something that's repeated over time. It's something that you experience over and over and over again in a particular situation, maybe. Uh, that's the only thing that I can particularly like comment on that. Um, but both of them, both harassment and, and discrimination um, are kind of, uh, are, are kind of like um, connected. I would say they are connected, so. No, it's just it's it's just an interesting it's an interesting change, and I mean, harassment is just defined later on in the bill um, as a form of discrimination. It's just an, it's just a it's just a different. Um, it, I don't I don't think it's a radical difference. I just think it's a different facet of of what we're talking about here. Sure. Right. Other other questions for me right now. Right. I so appreciate you being able to come back and and sharing your testimony. And um, they said next steps for us will be to um, actually have a walkthrough of this bill. To Representative Hango's point earlier, we we are switching things, you know, a little bit around on this because we did have a we did have this um, introduced last year. But I, I I really think we need to have a walkthrough with the attorney to understand the legal points right. that are being made. Um, Harassment, discrimination, and definitions, I guess, right? So. Well, and, and, and pervasive and all the stuff that we talked about yesterday, that was, um, and, and in particular, how the case, how this law or that phrase became part of law or understandings through a different process as Julio was testifying to, um, there's a lot to understand in this, in this bill um, before, as, as we move forward with it. Um, 
so thank you. Um, Brenda and Rachel, do either one of you want to um, add on to your testimony from yesterday or, or share some further thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like the opportunity to speak, but Rachel, I'll be gracious and let you go first. Well, thank you so much, Brenda. Um, yeah, I would love to add a little bit to what I shared yesterday, Chair Stevens, if, if we've got the time. Um, Absolutely. So, no, welcome back. Thank you. Um, and for the record, again, uh, my name is Rachel Seelig, and I'm the director of the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. Uh, in thinking about what I talked about yesterday, um, there were a couple of things that I felt um, were worth kind of adding and, and focusing in on. Um, one, I think, is connected to some of those questions you were just asking. When we think about severe and pervasive, we're talking about, and I think War explained this well yesterday, an incredibly high standard. And one that is so high that what it does is it creates a chilling effect. So people who um, have experienced bad treatment don't think it's worthwhile to make a complaint or to try and remedy the problem because it has, it's, it's not every single day and it's not you know, as bad as what they've heard of other horror stories. And so I think that is a big piece of why that language needs to come out of the common law that's been built up around uh, anti-discrimination law. Um, the second thing I wanted to, to touch on was, uh, I think Julio Thompson mentioned that this would be a way of untying our state law on fair employment practices from federal law um, and Title VII. I think it's important to note that it would also be untying, for example, the Vermont Public Accommodations Act from the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it would have a similar effect there in what I think is a good way, because like in the employment context, um, what happens is one court uses the severe and pervasive standard in employment, and then a, a public accommodations case comes along that's about that same protected class, and they adopt that severe and pervasive standard not in the employment context, but in the public accommodations context. So it finds that it winds its way into other parts of the law. Um, and the third thing that I wanted to mention is in terms of extending the six to the six year as a kind of standardized statute of limitations. The other thing that I would have suggested the committee to, to think about is that right now, if a person wants the Human Rights Commission or the Vermont Attorney General's Office to investigate their complaint before they decide that they wanna pursue this in court, they need to get that complaint in within 300 days of the last discriminatory act. That's a, that's a very short period of time, especially if you then have six years to bring your claim in court. Um, and I think folks have talked about, you know, the need for time to heal and be mentally ready to make a complaint like that. And so the, the other piece that I would think about in terms of getting to that six year statute of limitations is a longer period of time to make that complaint to one of those two bodies, depending on whether it's employment or public accommodations or state employment. Um, and then last, you were asking about Mia about the harassment and, and adding that kind of as an, almost as an or. I would really encourage you to think about it as one of many forms of discrimination. And I think the proposed language does that. Um, we've had a definition of harassment in state law in terms of education for a long time. And that actually shows up in the bill kind of near the end in the Title 16 section. One of the things that I think is important when we think about harassment is that it can be just one incident. Um, it could be verbal, it could be written, it could be visual, it could be physical conduct um, that's motivated by a person's membership in a protected class, whether that's their disability, which is what we deal with in my project, or national origin, or race, or color, or marital status, or sex, or sexual orientation, or gender identity. Um, and in the education context, the way that we've defined it is that it either has the purpose or effect of objectively and substantially undermining and detracting from or interfering with a student's educational performance. 
Um, and I know that that language is proposed to be a little bit modified to kind of bring that standard down as well. And I, again, I think that's a good thing because we do see schools deciding at the moment of a complaint that it's not gonna rise to that level and so they don't need to investigate it. And I think that gives us the wrong incentives that, that it should be, that we need to look into these incidents when they happen and support victims through them, rather than saying, we, we, from what you're telling us, it can't possibly be enough. And so we're not gonna do anything about it. Um, so, so those were the couple of extra points that I, that I was glad to have the opportunity to come back and make. And again, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Rachel, can you talk about, um, this came up in a conversation with someone else today that I had, um, the idea of, I, I believe the phrase that, the, the, I believe the phrase that Julio used was unhitching mm -hmm. from, from state law and federal law. Can you, can you give us an idea? You said, and you said that this particular bill, um, that would be a positive thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, my, my closest uh, parallel to this is when we discussed, when we, in the past, when we've discussed minimum wage law, where our minimum wage is higher than the federal law. So, so the more generous, um, the more generous number is what's considered active. Right. And then yet we have this time and a half thing where Vermont law restricts people from work who work those other jobs, those exemptions, especially from getting mm -hmm. time and a half. But yeah. federal law says, no, 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 you can't do that. And right. so can, it, that, that to me is what the, the unhitching there, but, but, but does it mean anything different in this, in this law? So what I think it means that's a little different here is that in Vermont, our courts would no longer be relying on, for example, cases out of Texas or California or Louisiana in terms of how those judges are interpreting this law because they, those courts are still relying on that higher standard of severe and pervasive. And our judges here in Vermont would be making a new common law um, in interpreting your statute um, at this, at this relax, relax is a difficult way of putting it, at this different standard that is not meant to be such an incredibly high bar. <laughs> you can see with my hands very well, but that incredibly high bar. So I think the way that it's, I think you have a good analogy in terms of uh, the wage, uh, the minimum wage piece, which is the federal government set this floor of minimum wage. We went above and beyond that floor, right? So you, you, that's a floor and we're going above and beyond. In, in the context of these anti-discrimination statutes, the courts established this very high bar. And we're saying that actually the floor should be lower down to be able to you know, get over this bar. It shouldn't be above my head. It should be at my neck, right? Um, and so I think that's maybe a little bit different is we're not trying to go above and beyond. We're trying to say people shouldn't have to reach such a high standard in order to get justice. All right. No, thank you for that um, clarification. It's just, it's, um, it's some, that's something that we'll we investigate as we move forward as well to understand. Thank you. Questions for Rachel? All right, Brenda, welcome back. Uh, Which thank, one is yours? Thank you, Chairman Stevens, and uh, hello, everybody, again. Um, I wanted to add just a couple quick things to uh, what, I, what I outlined yesterday. I'm sorry if it was a bit of a history lesson, but uh, we're still going to go back there again. Uh, and almost 40 years ago, when this was initialized, um, we did not have computers. We did not have handheld devices. We did not have access to each other the way that we do now. <clears throat> the the ways that people can be harassed and and people can be hated has grown exponentially, and we have not kept track. One of the things that's important to realize is that this bill was crafted without much input from the federal government, and let alone other uh, uh, governmental entities that had a handle on it. Now we're at a point almost 40 years later where we have the opportunity to bring this law into the next century. Um, literally a foundational piece of this legislation is to, I wouldn't say rose, <laughs> low, lowering the bar 
but making it accessible to the marginalized communities. Every day we have LGBTQ kids. We have marginalized communities. We have folks who face harassment on all levels, electronically, in person, and through their, their peer networks that I can't even begin to imagine. And yet we have not given the school, the school systems or our court systems enough tools to be able to look at this and say, yeah, most, yeah, I consider that awful behavior, but it doesn't reach this high mark. We want it to reach the high, we, we don't want it to reach the high mark. We want the mark to be different. We want us to be able to look at these differently. Um, our reporting systems need to be easier to access. Um, we need to ensure that there's safety in, in the reporting systems. And it really just modernizes what we had started uh, nearly four decades ago and brings us uh, brings us to a new level. And, and with that said, I, I just wanna make sure that we do this diligence carefully, that we look at the overall effects where it crosses into uh, things that we've never imagined and how are we gonna imagine them in the future as well. And uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, come back and just reiterate some of those things that are important uh, to all of us, but most specifically the people who are victims of, of harassment uh, and bias and hate. Um, it's everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, questions? Brenda, with your work and the work that you've done in your career with discrimination, um, what, what percentage of people I, this is a hard, I don't know if I'm going to word this right. Um, we heard from Carrie Brown that 80% of women experience sexual harassment at work. And that's, that's a statistic. That's fine. But, you know, in, in your line of work where, where, um, and the folks that you deal with, um, do you find that they have a pro have a problem even reporting discrimination for the fear of, um, I mean, in one of one of these bills, the one one part of this bill was the idea that of, of comparing, like the, the the discrimination that you're suffering or experiencing is got to be the same as someone else's. Um, do you have people who are not reporting instances simply because the bar is too high? Is that is that what you're saying? You know, that's a that's a great question. Um... And one of the things that I hear is incidentally, things get back to me with regard to, did you call the police? No, they they won't listen. They didn't respond. They didn't come out. That's actually the initial point of contact for a lot of this harassment and discrimination. Um, the reporting agencies, the folks that we talk to um, sometimes just don't want to listen or it doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't meet their objectives to what they feel would happen in the court farther up. I think if the message comes from the top down, that people are being listened to, that reports are being taken, that the hierarchy now is more uh, easy to access and to, to have these reports done. And I, I look at um, specifically things that happen in schools. Uh, when, when kids report to uh, whoever they might, a teacher or guidance counselor that they've they've been harassed or that, or that somebody uh, threatened them online. Um, we don't hear about those. We don't get that. And I'm betting it happens every day. From a community standpoint, I don't know anybody who has not, in my community, the transgender community, who has not had a bias or a discrimination thing happen to them. And very hard to describe specifically because each one is like a fingerprint. <laughs> nobody, nobody implements hate the same way, but there's a theme of discrimination and bias that just underlies it all. 100% um, might be too high, 50% might be way too low. Um, but again, I don't hear all the wonderful, wonderful stories. I hear the, the harder stories. I hear what happens to people and where they get roadblocks or where they get stopped or why they don't go on. And usually it comes to me like, no, I didn't report it. Why not? Nobody wanted to listen. No agency took up the, the information. 
and it may be the nature of the beast um, because of the fear uh, people have of, of being their authentic selves, uh, of being out to their community. I'm by far a bold exception, and there aren't a lot of people that want to display themselves in a way that takes into consideration all of the history, but yet it's there. Um, it drives me, it makes me motivated to, to talk. Uh, I'm sure Mia has equally uh, the number of stories that she can relate um, of people who got harassed, people who were discriminated against, but it didn't go any further. And whether that's our legal system or bills that keep us pinned to the floor, I don't know. I'm hoping that this will be at least a good step in the right direction. And I, I really do advocate you passing this. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much. I hope that answered your question. Clucky, you had your hand up. Are you okay? Or do you have a question? All right. Um, no, thank you all. I'm glad you came back um, to fill in, you know, to fill in some of the gaps and to have an opportunity to to, to um, further your testimony. And and um, it's good to see you. And I hope you all have a good weekend. Um, and we will be, like I said, our next step on this bill is to get a full walkthrough understand the the details that you've all um and the previous witnesses have alluded to in their testimony so thank you